For every dollar you spend, about eight cents will actually get back to the farmer. Oh, wow. So where does all the rest of that money go? Wow. Transportation, processing, and marketing. So everybody else has to get paid, and the farmer is a price taker. So if you look at the price of milk today, and if you went back when my dad was milking cows in 1950, it was $4 a hundred a weight, and he bought a home for $8,800. There is no longer a market for the small family farm. Right. In the last 20 years, there was two years where they made profit. 200 of those small farms are gonna disappear because of one huge farm. Yeah. So the government could help farmers by allowing them to market to the consumers through farmers markets, mm -hmm. deliver to the homes, yeah. CSAs, group purchasing plans, That's whatever. Cool. I have a permit to sell raw milk, but I can only sell it on my farm, mm -hmm. which is a market control yes. issue. Right. Hi, welcome back to the Sustainable Farm Podcast. My name is Jaylee and I'm here with Farmer Jerry. And today we're discussing why so many dairy farmers are going out of business. So Farmer Jerry, what's happening to the farmers? Well, uh, we, we learned a lot about raw milk and part of what we learned was the industrial model right. has taken over. Yep. So in the industrial model, you... Uh, you specialize. Agricultural is a biological process. Mm -hmm. Okay. When you try to take the stamp of industrial model and put on something living and biological, yeah. it's frustrating. That's sure. why it's why it was the last thing to be industrialized. Mm -hmm. They oppose. Uh, it's easier in a factory. Mm -hmm. Automobiles, much, much easier. So... Uh, it took some adapting. It took a lot of technology. Uh, it took a lot of cheap labor. Yeah. Um, and it's very precarious. Mm -hmm. Now, in the industrial model, we talked about in the beginning an agrarian society. Yes. Everybody was sustainable. Everybody was farming. Right. And then we moved into the cities. And, and then the, the population changed. Mm -hmm. We are no longer a rural nation mm -hmm. the cities have the have the density and the yeah. and the population yeah. so most of our food is transported right transportation right. is not cheap that is true if there's one thing you get, you get have out of all day long transportation is not cheap remember that because the solution is going to hinge on the transportation mm -hmm. okay Transportation is expensive. Let's let me just talk you through what happens in the dairy model. Yeah. Okay. Lay it out for me. So you have all these small family farms. I'm going to say a small family farm is less than 100 cows. Okay. It used to be when I in the 1970s when I started we had 55 cows, and a freestall barn was built in the community, yeah. and they had 100 cows, and that was huge. Today's society, with the technology that we have, we have rotary parlors where cows climb on and they're milked while they're going around. Wow. And they, and they have robots. Mm -hmm. um, we have technology like we never had. Yeah, well, that's definitely okay. true. So you have farms, milking dairy farms with 40,000 cows. And that's, that's what you'd consider a very large scale, that, one of the major players. Okay. But what you need to understand is, let's let's go back to 100 cows. Mm -hmm. If you're milking 100 cows and you have another neighbor that's milking 5,000 cows, yeah. which farm has the lower cost to produce 100 pounds of milk? The larger farm. The larger farm. It's called the economy of scale. Okay. If you're producing something, you're going to have to have a manufacturing facility to, so you're going to have to have a building and the tools, the machinery, yeah, and then you have to market it. The bigger that flow mm -hmm. through there, yeah, and the more hours. If you're running three shifts, there's more profit. Yes, and this is this is the industrial model. And then they're able to provide their milk at a cheaper cost because okay. of that. So if you're milking a hundred cows and the neighbor goes to five hundred cows, yeah. You have to add cows. Mm -hmm. I was sitting at a meeting, probably the best meeting I've ever been taught at. It was in Pike, New York. <clears throat> it was on quality milk. Mm -hmm. Cornell University was teaching it. And next to me at the lunch 
when we were eating lunch was a, a farmer that came from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. He milked 60 cows in Pennsylvania. He was milking 120 cows here. Okay. Now, why did he increase the size of his herd? Because of the larger farms surrounding him. Okay. He couldn't compete. Right. I'm five feet eight. You put me on the basketball court with six foot nine. <laughs> right. I can't compete. Right. They're just, they're too big for me. Yeah. So if you're going to stay in business, you need to make a bigger farm. Yeah. You have to have more cows, mm -hmm. which means you need to buy out the neighbor's land. Mm -hmm. So now we have a competitive model yeah. where my continuing to farm depends on me buying you out mm -hmm. when you go out of business mm -hmm. and adding more land and cows. And this has been going on. Wow. Now, when you have a, a farm that appears that's milking 10 or 20,000 cows, how many hundred cow farms? See, there's not more milk being consumed. Right, right. And so... And it goes back to the supply and demand issue. Okay. So now that small farm is going to disappear. Yeah, yeah. A lot of small farms are going to just. 200 of those small farms are going to disappear because of one huge farm. Now, they have outside capital, outside labor. Uh, there's one that's going up in Webster, here up from up around Webster. Mm -hmm. It's Coca-Cola's putting it up. Fair life. Dairy farm. Yeah. Wow. Now, I'm not going to get into that, but you're making faces <laughs> at me. Well, why are they... Well, you you come up with the answer to right. that. I don't understand it. Now, here's where I want to segue from here because, and I, I, honestly, I know that this is one of the questions that we're going to discuss in this podcast, but personally, I think it could be its own podcast uh, episode. What you just said about this new Fairlife dairy coming to my area, what does that mean for the food itself? With all these small farms going out of business and being replaced with all of these large 10,000, okay. 20,000 cow operations. What it means is that we have food insecurity. Now, we, we talked in the raw milk topic mm -hmm. about the beef industry. Mm -hmm. And when COVID hit, there was no beef. Now, there was beef on the hoof. Mm -hmm. There was pork in the pig barns, mm -hmm. but there wasn't any in the store. Mm. They had to euthanize those hogs the dairy farmers had to dump that milk. This gets circulated around Instagram, and I know that this creates a lot of really strong emotions when it comes to that waste. Yeah. We talked about transportation being expensive. Yeah. What kind of expense is it when the, the grassroots supplier mm -hmm. loses their market for their product and they have to just waste it? It's a huge waste uh, expense from a cost standpoint for the farmer itself. Well, they're already not making money. I right. told you right. in the last 20 years, there was two years where they made profit. So when the market wow. itself, the industrial model, I, I use this mm -hmm. triangle because it gets smaller and smaller. Right. And this book, it creates a crisis. Mm -hmm. And it could be, I'll give you a specific example. Uh, when you have a large facility in Demet, Texas, last April, there was a fire. And 18,000 cows burned in that fire. In one day, 3% of Texas milk production was lost. Wow. Wow. Too many, too, too many eggs in one basket. So. Exactly. Yeah. So you have food insecurity because if something fails... It affects the supply. It, it fails large. It fails everybody. So, so there's the food insecurity. Speak to um, the health of the animals and then in, in, in then by extension the health of the food that we're eating. Because if you've got, you know, the, the cows are not being handled the same in a 40,000 cow operation as they're okay. being handled in a 100 cow operation. All right. I'm going to use the illustration of a race car, a drag strip race car. Okay, they're all about Speed. Yeah. So they got huge horsepower engines, mm -hmm. and they run down the strip, and they got to beat the clock. Yes. And this this is a picture of a dairy cow. 
Okay. Producing milk, a hundred pounds a day. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of stress. Yeah. On, on that cow. On the cow, yeah. And they're feeding them high octane fuel. Mm -hmm. It's not grass. Right. It's corn and it's, soy. It's and... a lot of grain. It's a lot of stuff, and it it changes the pH of the stomach. So that drag strip car is not going to last three hundred thousand miles. No. They're going to have to overhaul that engine. Well, these cows get burned up in two or three lactations, and so they have to be replaced. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go to, I have an article right here. It says, Dairy Needs Real Innovation. What does the word innovation mean? Innovation. Um, change in a positive direction. Okay. So we have a crisis. Yeah. The industrial model is mature. Why do I say it's mature? Because there is no longer a market for the small family farm. Right. right. It only picks up the milk from these big ones. Mm -hmm. And I'm not against a big farm. Some of them are very well run. Okay. Okay. Um, I'm not against a tall basketball player either. <laughs> right. Okay. So we each have our place. However, when it, when it eliminates a market for a needed substance like food, like mm -hmm. milk, mm -hmm. And the consumers want it. We have a problem. Yeah. And this this was happening. W. D. Horde was the governor of Wisconsin in the late eighteen hundreds, okay. eighteen eighty five. Wisconsin was growing wheat year after year after year, mm -hmm. and they were losing farmers. Okay. Is that what we're talking about? Yes. We're losing farmers. Right. Yep. Okay. We're losing dairy farmers. Yeah. Well. Why were the wheat-growing farmers, they were getting a lot of disease pressure. Mm -hmm. They were growing the same crop repetitively. Yes. And when not you, rotating it or anything. Okay. Why, what's the benefit of rotating a crop? The, the pest pressure and disease and Okay. Whatnot. Yeah. When, when you look at nature, it's very diverse. Yeah. And when you plant a crop, it feeds on certain nutrients. Yes. And if you do the same crop, you're going to deplete... Okay, yep. The nutrition that that crop mm -hmm. needs, but if you mix it up, yeah, it you, gets, yeah. If you plant if you plant something that is um, depleting the nutri uh, the nitrogen in the soil, then you want to rotate in something that's going to replenish the nitrogen. Put a legume in, so, okay? Yeah. So W. D. Horde was the governor of Wisconsin, mm -hmm. and these farmers were going out of business. So here was his plan. Let's. Stop growing wheat mm -hmm. because we're depleting the soil. Mm -hmm. It's resulting in a lot of pressure, infestation, yep. disease. The farmers are not making money. We need to reinvent how we do this. Mm -hmm. So he brought the dairy cow on because the dairy cow feeds the soil through the manure. Yeah, yeah. It's a recycling. And if you know anything about nature, there are water cycles. Mm -hmm. Everything has a cycle. And the older generation dies off, mm -hmm. and then the new babies replace it. Yes. You know, a chicken lays an egg, mm -hmm. hatches that out, and they it just keeps it going. Yeah. So we need to mimic nature and leave the factory farming, the industrial model. Oh, yes. Because here's what happens. The reason farmers are going out of business, the, the strategy of industrial farming mm -hmm. is to purchase outside inputs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, to, re to replace with fertilizer. Right. If you're growing corn and soybeans yeah. and that's all you do, yeah. you have no animals. So you have no manure to mm -hmm. feed the soil. Right. So you have to purchase your fertilizer. Well, as things get cons con consolidated, mm. the fertilizer companies are fewer and far between. Yeah. And the prices go up. Right. This is the the beauty of the industrial model is it gives you cheap food mm -hmm. until you reach that point right, right, right. where a few companies control it mm -hmm. and then they set the price. It's definitely not a perfect model by any stretch of the imagination. Well, it doesn't work for biological things. Right. And it's it's what is squeezing out the small farmers. So talk about then um, practically now cost of production. How can the small farmers keep up? Okay. So I have a little chart <clears throat> that I clipped out of the newspaper. 
and it has cost of production by number of cows in the herd. Mm -hmm. And right now the price of milk <clears throat> is just below twenty dollars a hundred weight, say mm -hmm. nineteen. Mm -hmm. And if you look on that little chart, a two thousand cow dairy mm -hmm. produces milk at about twenty dollars a hundred weight. Okay. So if you have two thousand cows, you can probably pay the bills and make it through right now. If you are milking one hundred and twenty cows, you're not. The cost of production for a small farm like that is forty dollars per hundred pounds of milk. Now, why is it so much higher? There's a lot of physical labor and manual labor in the smaller operation. There's a lot more technology and multitudes of cows yeah. under one manager yeah. on the industrial model. So it's a double-edged sword. It gives you cheap food, but it takes a lot of inputs. And some of the, some of the problems we're running into, actually, I'm going to a dairy summit, dairy innovation summit in April. And uh, robotics. Do you believe a robot can milk a cow? Yeah, I know that they are. Well, I follow some dairies on Instagram. <laughs> I, I grew up with some dairy farmers. Yeah. And when my dad was still alive, uh, he, he, worked, he drove tractor for a guy that has robots milking his cows. Yeah. And he told one of these former dairy farmers about it. Mm -hmm. And the guy denied it. He says... <laughs> You can't milk a cow with a robot. <laughs> and Dad said, come with me. <laughs> Should you? That's the question. Okay. Can you? Yeah. Okay. And the, you know what? That's a question that nobody asks. Right. Just because we can pave 800 acres with solar panels. Should we? Should we? Right. Right. Just because, you know, all the, all these questions are not being asked. And just because it's feasible and Everybody says, well, you can't stop change, right? Mm. I mean, you can't live in the past. We're not going back to horse and buggies. I think you just ha it's important, and, and that's why I'm glad we are doing this podcast, to, ex to un help people understand why these things matter, because the robot is such a great example of um, giving you a practical idea of everything we've talked about so far in this episode, because the small dairy farm can't possibly keep up with the farm that's using the robots. And the farm that's using the robots is able to put out so much more than the small farm. But that doesn't mean that it's right or that it's the right way to do things or that it's the sustainable way to do things. OK. So what does it mean to be sustainable? That's a that's an overused word. It is. Yeah. So you're, give me your definition. What do um, you think? Sustainable means I can keep doing. Let's say I'm mowing hay and the bales are coming up the conveyor and I'm in the mow. And I'm stacking them in place. Mm. Sustainable means I can keep up. Yeah. And keep going. Right. If, uh, you know, the I Love Lucy where she's working in the candy factory. Yeah. And, the, and she's doing it, putting them in the boxes. Yeah. And then the lady goes on and cranks it up faster. Uh -huh. It was unsustainable. Right. right. She couldn't keep up. Right. So what we're doing, and when we mean it, it won't keep up, it has to work for the animals. Mm -hmm. It has to work for the consumer. Yeah. It has to work for the environment. The We're talking the soil. Yeah. Okay. All of these things, and, and there has to be a balance. Actually, the key to life is balance. Yeah. When I fall down, it doesn't get pretty. So any business, uh, and to be honest with you, it happened with our local grocery stores. Really? Do you have a local grocery store? Uh, or do you have a chain? I, yeah, I have a chain. Okay. We have chains left. Yeah. Just I've never really thought about it. Think about the retail sector. Yeah. We've been focusing on the processing environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The retail sector is controlled. Yeah, wow. Okay? We're not going to mention any names, but the local mom-and-pop hardware store is hard to find. Mm -hmm. The local-owned grocery store is hard to find. I feel like that is a lot, that's a very direct... Uh, picture to paint in comparison to what we're talking about okay. here because you're right it's the same concept so you go into the dairy industry uh, we have laws against monopolies many years ago the trusts were broken up you know the railroad trusts the oil trusts mm. these companies got so big they controlled transportation and energy wow and they were busted up mm -hmm. in order to have a free a growing economy, yeah. a capitalist system, yeah. you got to have freedom in the market. Mm -hmm. 
if you don't have freedom in the market, there is no competition. Right. We referred to the beef industry, four companies. Yeah. Uh, there's very few processing plants in America. Yeah. Uh, we were shipping milk. Our organic milk was being processed in Winston, Virginia. Can you imagine driving a tractor trailer load of milk to Winston, Virginia every other day? And that was just for processing, and then it was shipped out from there. Then it goes to distribution. Yeah. And then it goes to the retail wow. stores. Do you know what the cost of transportation would be on that milk? Milk is 88% water. It's heavy. Yeah. It is. Yeah, I, I can see what you mean. A big truck full of it would be very heavy. And it's got to be refrigerated. Yeah. Wow. So that truck has its own, you know, inside mechanics to keep it cold. And Now, this creates its own new thing. Now we have to have longer shelf life. Yeah. So we ultra pasteurize it. Mm -hmm. Now, what is, we've been talking about raw milk and pasteurizing. Yeah. We haven't even talked about ultra pasteurizing. Do you know what temperature that is? I don't. When you pasteurize milk, originally it was 160 degrees okay. for 30 minutes. Okay. That's just regular pasteurization. That's low, low temperature vat pasteurization. Oh. Very few do that today. Yeah. They're specialty milks. Mm -hmm. The whole purpose for that is it maintains as much of that nutrition yes, right. and the enzymes still not very is still much living <laughs> but some yeah it's still got some of that nutrition yeah, in, yeah, yeah. that you need so when they when they transport this milk because they have few processing plants mm -hmm. and they've got to ship it all over they need a shelf life a sell by date that goes out there yeah and ultra pasteurization is 283 degrees I, th I knew it was going to be in the 200. I didn't know it was going to What's be the high. boiling point of water? Is it 212? 212. I'm boiling sap right after we get done with this podcast. And it's syrup when it's 219. Wow. So we're talking taking milk, a living, perishable food, and it's steam. And zapping it. 283 degrees. Everything. It kills it. Everything. It it's, kills. It's just yeah. white water at that yeah. point. <laughs> as far as the nutrition or the benefit yeah, yeah. to your body. Yeah. It's no longer. But this is where we are. Yeah. Can you speak? Is there in terms of the government policies, subsidies and trade agreements, is there anything that you can speak of um, specifically that's really just killing the family farm, the, the small farm? Well, we have. Because they don't enforce the antitrust laws. Yeah. We have a monopoly. Yes. In the dairy industry. Right. And when you control Everything? Yeah. Um, can't think of the saying. It corrupts. Yeah. Let's just be honest. It corrupts. Yeah. No, it does. When you're the only player in the in the game, right. you, you, you throw your weight rules. around. Yep. Yeah. So we have that situation, and the farmers can't address a company that size. Right. They're... Now, if you go to Europe, what's going on over there in agriculture? I'm not sure. There's farmer protests. Okay. In the Netherlands, well, in other hear, countries. I heard about this in France, I think. Okay. Yeah. So the farmers are being told uh, for environmental reasons, they're going to have to get rid of cows. They're going to have to stop using fertilizers. We're, we're reaching the crisis of the industrial model. Mm -hmm. And we're going to get to the solution in a minute. But the policies that the government has, yeah. number one, you need to understand that the government agencies mm -hmm. are run by these monopolies. Mm -hmm. We, yeah. need, we just need to be honest. If that's a shock to you, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't like it, but that's the truth. Yeah. Uh, so we have a conflict of interest right there. Mm -hmm. And they set the laws. Uh, you talked about raw milk being illegal. Yeah. That, was, that came from the FDA. Yeah. Uh, I have statements from them mm -hmm. as to their view of raw milk, and it's not supportive at all. Right, right. And there's a reason for that. And that's because we have a dairy monopoly. Yeah. And so oh, uh, good luck with that. <laughs> but we're going to get into. We have some potential solutions here that okay. we're going to talk about. So, so the very simplest solution, and I have a petition. I've been circulating uh, for several years. Yeah. And the petition asks people to contact the government officials. Mm-hmm. And ask for a simple wording change in the raw milk regulations. 
I think you've said these words a few times. <laughs> On this? farm sales only. On farm sales only. So if I have a license, actually I have a New York State driver's license. Yep. And I can drive anywhere. They'll even let me into Canada if I have the right ID. Yeah. Um, but I have a permit to sell raw milk, but I can only sell it on my farm, mm -hmm. which is a market control yes. issue. Right. It's it's stopping the spread of something. It's keeping it very in one location. It makes it legal, but not economically viable. Right. Right. So you're not going to have a riot over those words, but the farmers aren't going to go very far with it. Mm -hmm. Unless you're on the main road just outside of New York City mm -hmm. and you've got a million people driving by, mm -hmm. then you can do pretty well. And I yeah. know some friends that are doing quite well. Good. Yep. But what about the rest of us all over rural New York State? Right. Because it goes back to that transportation issue. Yeah. Uh, if I can't take it from the farm, now... We talked about milk being perishable. Mm -hmm. So you don't have a lot of time. If it's fresh, what's the shelf life of raw milk? This is um, if, it's, if it's refrigerated? Yep. Mine usually is like pleasantly drinkable for about two weeks before it starts to turn and get okay. a little sour. And it's still good after it does that, but it's just not as pleasant to drink. Okay. It all depends. That's a... It covers everything when you're asked a question. It all depends. <laughs> right. Uh, if you have very clean milk with a low somatic cell count, which is a reflection on the health of the cow. Okay. And if you keep it cold in a clean container, uh, I had some customers, actually their daughter was going to school at Alfred University. Yeah. And they were from New Jersey and they got three weeks out of it. Oh, wow. Okay. Now that's exceptional and I would not advertise that, but they did the right job of keeping it cold yeah and the milk was very clean see the shelf life of a product is just a reflection of the bacteria yes and the multiplication of that yep. bacteria so that's why it's important to keep the containers clean and to keep it cold mm -hmm. and then you will have a very sweet tasting product yeah so the government could help farmers by when they have a permit to sell raw milk allowing them to market to the consumers through farmers markets, mm -hmm. uh, deliver to the homes, yeah. uh, CSAs, whatever group purchasing plans, so whatever. Say the words again. Okay. On farm sales only. So you've got a petition to get those four words removed from the current right. um, rules that are in place. Well, if I'm inspected monthly, yeah. the milk is sampled and tested in the Albany Food Lab. Yeah. New York State has control and they know it's clean. Mm hmm and I'm licensed, submitted to their authority. Yeah. So why should I not, not be able to sell that? Because you you will start making money and somebody else will make less money. <laughs> so we've, we've talked a lot about big farms. Right. And how small farms have a higher cost. One thing I, I haven't mentioned, when you spend, if you're a consumer yep. and you go grocery shopping, yeah. for every dollar you spend... Depending on the commodity, about eight cents will actually get back to the farmer. Oh, wow. So where does all the rest of that money go? Wow. Transportation. Yeah. Remember we talked about transportation? Mm -hmm. Transportation is huge. I'm sure it's in the cost. Very costly. Processing. Yep. And marketing. Yeah. So everybody else has to get paid. Yeah. And the farmer is a price taker. So if you look at the price of milk today, and if you went back when my dad was milking cows in 1950, mm -hmm. it was four dollars a hundred a weight in 1950. Yeah, and he bought a home for eighty eight hundred dollars. Jeez, wouldn't you like to buy one? <laughs> I would. <laughs> I knew that I'd like would get you. I'd like to be able to buy a car for eighty eight hundred dollars. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, the dollar back then, yeah, was different. Well, the price of milk today, I told you, was nineteen dollars. Yep. It was four dollars back then. Wow. But you could buy a house. Right. For $10,000. Right. So cows are producing a lot more milk. Mm -hmm. Farms are milking more cows. Yeah. They're much more efficient and overworked. Yeah. But they're still not making any money. So what is the solution yeah. to this? What is it, Farmer Gary? Okay. So we talked about transportation being so expensive. Yeah. So we need to get back... And I have an article here called Dairy Needs Real Innovation 
and it talks about William D. Horde. This was out of Horde's magazine. Oh, wow. Yeah. And it was written by three professors. Mm -hmm. One of them is a grad student. And it involves grass-fed milk and a local food system. Okay. Yeah. Now, we talked about the farmers that were growing wheat and how they were going out of business. Yeah. So this is not a first-time experience down this road. Right. Right. And W.D. Horde was the governor, mm -hmm. and he changed to allow the animals to take care of the soil mm -hmm. so that they didn't have the problems. They rotated the crops because yeah. they were feeding them to the cows. Yeah. They changed the agriculture, mm -hmm. the approach. They made it biological by including the cow yeah. and taking care of the soil yeah. instead of the industrial model. Right. If you can take that and do it with grass because a cow is fueled by grass mm -hmm. and you have a small family farm. Mm -hmm. Now, we talked about the consolidation and the food insecurity. Consol yep. Okay? yep. Because we have monopolies. And when they fail, like in the beef system during COVID, yeah. then you have no food. Right, right. If we had huge farms running through the industrial model, yeah. continuing to do their thing, and these small family farms, they have the family labor. Mm -hmm. They don't need to buy robots. Right. They can do the milking. Right. They just need a market. Yeah. It sounds like what you guys are doing. Well, we, there's a saying, necessity is the mother of invention. Yes. Yes. I have heard that before. Okay. So when you get to a crisis, you think outside the box. Yeah. You think, what could we do? How could we change this to make it work? Yeah. See, we already have the land. We already have the animals. Yeah. We already have the you buildings. We're already doing it. We have everything. Yeah. The equipment is all there. Mm -hmm. We just lack the market, a viable, what's viable mean? Um, active. It works. Yeah. It, so eight set of the Eight cents of the consumer dollar spent on milk actually gets to the dairy farmer in the current. In the conventional model of things. Right. Yeah. If, if we're failing because we have food insecurity. Yeah. But we have local farms all across rural New York that right. need a market. Why not give them a market? Well, and then this moves into community, creating community, community support of these smaller farmers and I'm seeing that happen with you guys because you started um, – I won't be able to share the story as accurately as you, but I have a kind of a general understanding of how you guys – you know, you stopped selling to the the big guys that you were selling to and you opened it up. And it, very quickly, you guys ended up being able to sell out of your milk because I, I personally, I think part of it from what I've heard is because – during COVID, you guys were here. You were filling a need that wasn't being filled elsewhere, and it opened so many people's eyes to, wait a second, we need these small farms. So you have that community support aspect. Still kind of small scale, very niche in our little area here, but... What it does, we use ball glass canning jars with a wide mouth. Yep. We have a family-owned hardware store. That supplies us. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes. Now we have 300 customers. Yeah. How many jars? So many. <laughs> they deliver them by the pallet. Wow. wow. Six jars in a case. I don't know, 25 cases on a pallet. Mm -hmm. And the guy was delivering some last week because you need a set of jars in the consumer's refrigerator mm -hmm. and then you need jars to fill. Yes. Yeah. So you need double the amount of jars. Right, right, right. right. So I asked him, I said, how many jars? He thought he'd made seven trips since he got hired bringing pallets of jars Aww. to us. So you're supporting your community. I told you the multiplier is seven. Yeah. For every dollar that we take in, yeah. we spend it to the local community right. seven different ways. Right. Yes. And it supports the local business. Yeah. This is the very root of our economy. Yeah. So we're not talking just... What am I going to eat? Mm -hmm. But is this economy going to thrive? Yeah. And this is a simple fix. Wow. It isn't going to take anything but a willing heart to say, yes, we can do it. 
And, you know, it's these things sound so nice. And they to, I think so many people will like hear something like this and be like, oh, someday. But you're doing it now. I mean, this what you're explaining is happening for you right now. Well, we we have bills to pay mm. uh, and we have fresh quality food. Yeah. That needs yeah. to find a home. Yeah. And I just told you we have families coming from Canada. Wow. Which is a drive. And most of our consumers are two to three hours. Now, we talked about transportation. Mm -hmm. And that is a difficult challenge until you come into the CSA. Do you know what CSA stands for? Community Supported Agriculture. Okay. This is the part that you can play in making this happen. Because if all these small family farms get this mindset, and that's my goal in my retirement is to show them a way that will work for them. Yeah. To create an avenue that they could take. Yeah. It might look different than ours. Everything is going to have its own variation. Yeah. But at least show them what is possible. If the community understands the health benefits and the, the food security that can be gained, and if they... I know the demand is there. There's already 10 million people that are consuming raw milk daily. Yeah. But if they would go to their local farm and express a desire and find out how they're farming and if they'd be interested, you could have food security for all these small family farms. You could have environmentally friendly cows eating grass. It would be very pretty. Yeah, it would. It would. And then you could have children staying on the farm, yeah. raising the grandchildren, and we would have a sustainable agriculture. Yeah, that's so nice. And it's possible. It is completely possible. Yep. And it's what we were doing before, it, back in the picture that you painted in the last episode. We except, were doing except when we talked about, when we started talking about the health crisis yeah. in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. This time we have refrigeration. Right. We have milking machines. Right. We have stainless steel. Mm -hmm. We have all the technology to make it safer and cleaner. Yes. And more readily available. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've in 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 our growth from where we started, you know, back in the picture you painted in the 1800s, I think we've overcompensated <laughs> a bit. And so now I think we're at a place where we can say, how can we take all of the modern luxuries that we've been given in terms of refrigeration and transportation, and how can we marry that with a more sustainable way of doing things so that we can have small family farms and generational living and we can get these healthier foods out to people um, but still utilize. It's not the 1800s anymore. We've got refrigeration and we've got all of these things. What, so what does that future look like marrying these two together? We, we are definitely not against technology. Right. I don't want to get a horse in a buggy. Right. No. Uh, the fine line is called appropriate use mm. of technology. Mm -hmm. And you can only use something appropriately when you have complete understanding. Mm. And that's really the goal of this podcast yeah. is to empower you with the big picture, understanding where we started, what happened that went wrong? Mm -hmm. I mean, we had some crisis, some severe crisis. We went through a growth mode. I mean, America became yeah. the incredible power that it is. Right. Because of the natural resources. Mm -hmm. But we're not usually, we are losing over 50% of our topsoil. <sighs> and it's contaminated with glyphosate. Well. Yeah. And the animals are not doing well. Right. And then we're not doing And well. people are not healthy. Right. And so... The word appropriate use mm -hmm. needs to be, we need to spend a lot of time is how should we do this? Right now, windmills and solar panels are huge. Yeah. And to be honest with you, they are the most viable next step yeah. for these struggling farmers mm -hmm. because they have the land yeah. and the companies are offering easy money, Yeah, which will take farmland out of production mm -hmm. and increase the crisis yeah. that we're facing right as far as food insecurity right put it on the roof 
keep the cows on the grass yeah. and let the farmers farm the fields. We've given you a plan, and if you want to come to Sunny Cove Farm and see what it looks like or give me a call, um, it's a very, very refreshing way to farm. It is. And it's a and healthy it's way. Sustainable. And it is sustainable, <laughs> yes. I love that. That's really good. Well, and I'm glad that we're doing this podcast because, you know, as we continue to go through these episodes, we are going to be able to paint that picture even more vividly than we have already in terms of where this is going and what this is going to look like moving forward. So very well done. Yep. But I think that'll do it. Is there anything else that you wanted to add? Um, the future looks good. Mm-hmm. We're expecting grandchild number 10. I want to stick around and... Uh, See what happens in the next 30 years. I love that. It's going to be beautiful to watch. Yes, it will. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Sustainable Farm Podcast.